بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. Inshallah, before we even get started, I um, wanted to appreciate all the brothers and sisters that came out uh, in person to attend the event and wanted to apologize to everybody tuning in online for the later start. Um, we were mistaken. We thought that Salat al-Isha uh, was still at 7.45 and time had switched to 8 p.m. So that was an oversight on our part and I apologize for that. Uh, but alhamdulillah, we're starting pretty much immediately after Salat al-Isha. So hopefully you can still tune in and stay with us, inshallah. I want I wanted to start off by, of course, welcoming everyone to the webcast uh, by Quran Weekly. Uh, specifically, wanted to thank, along with the Islamic Association of Carrollton, for very graciously hosting the event. Wanted to thank Ikna Relief for sponsoring the event. They sponsored the previous webcast as well. They're sponsoring this webcast as well. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all the work that Ikna Relief does uh, all across the U.S., all across the country. Um, inshallah, we are going to have a Q&A after the lecture, um, but like I said, that'll be after the lecture. In the meantime, if you do have any questions that arise, that come up during the actual course of the discussion and the event, and you'd like to go ahead and start submitting your questions, inshallah, to be answered, um, if you go to Quran Weekly's Facebook page, um, over there, uh, there should be some type of a status or something posted that basically says if you have any questions, put them in the comments here. So inshallah, in the comment section there, if you can leave your questions, the Quran Weekly admin will be uh, recording the questions, noting them down, and passing them on to me. And inshallah, after the lecture, uh, the presentation's over, it's complete. Uh, then inshallah, we'll go to uh, the Q&A section of the program, inshallah. So the topic for today, obviously, uh, very appropriately titled was uh, a love story, uh, which we could call the ultimate love story. And it's, of course, in regards to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the messenger of God, peace and blessings be upon him, and his beloved wife, Khadija radiallahu anha, may Allah be pleased with her. I wanted to really keep this... Um, a healthy balance between the obvious, the presentation uh, of the story. I wanted to tell the actual story so that we're able to really feel, um, you know, what the relationship was like and how strong the emotions were and the real presence of love that we are able to learn from this beautiful story of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. But at the same time, wanted this to be beneficial in the capacity that everyone was able to take home some knowledge, some beneficial information about the life of the Prophet ﷺ. So what I'd like to start off by presenting to you is a little bit of a snapshot of who these two individuals were. So first and foremost we have Muhammad ibn Abdullah, Muhammad the son of Abdullah, who was the son of Abdul Muttalib wasallam. The Prophet ﷺ was born in this great city of Mecca. He was born into an extremely noble family. His grandfather was of course a unified leader of Arabia, uh, Abdul Muttalib, and his father was a very young, bright, intelligent, talented, um, very sought after young man. Um, by the name of Abdullah. He was the apple of his father's eye. He was very beloved to the entire family. And he passed away at a very, very young age while the, his wife Amina was expecting their first and their only child who would be Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu therefore was basically born um, a couple of months after the passing of his father. So he was born to a single mother. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in spite of his father not being there, he always had a loving um, and a very positive presence, male presence in his life, primarily provided by his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib. Eventually, the mother of the Prophet ﷺ would also pass away when he was only six years old. But again, that did not leave to him being deprived of love, but he was loved by his grandfather um, unconditionally. His grandfather would not do anything without his beloved grandchild, who he loved so much, and he had taken full responsibility for. Then his grandfather would pass away two years after his mother passed away, at the age of eight. And at this point in time, he didn't have any direct family members. His grandfather passed away, his parents were gone, he didn't have any siblings. But now he was in the care of his uncle Abu Talib. 
And Abu Talib loved him like one of his own. So again, there's a very interesting balance. The Prophet ﷺ suffered the loss of these people very early on in his life, which without a doubt is tragic for an individual. But at the same time, they did not deprive him of love. Because Allah always blessed him with a loving presence in his life. And he was raised by his uncle as one of his own. He loved him very, very much and looked after him. Now the Prophet ﷺ, as he was growing into a young, mature man, his uncle Abu Talib who took care of him was a very noble man but was a very simple man. When I say simple, I mean of simple, humble means. He was not a very wealthy individual because he was such an ethic, ethical and moral person that he would not earn any money through unlawful means. And so he, every penny that he earned was earned honestly. So because of that, he had a very um, financially tight situation. He, was, he wasn't very wealthy, did not have an abundance of wealth. And he had many, many children. On top of that, he was caring for his uh, nephew, Muhammad Now the Prophet وسلم, feeling this and realizing this, wanted to help out at home. And so he asked, can I go and get a job? Now because of being from Quraysh and Banu Hashim, a very respectable family in Mecca, it wasn't appropriate, it wasn't deemed appropriate for a young man of this lineage and this family to take some type of odd job. But rather they said there's only two jobs that our people are allowed to do, our men are allowed to engage in. We do business, but you're obviously too young to go and you know, embark on business. And the Prophet ﷺ said that, I want to start a business with my own money. Like I'd like to come up with my own seed money. And since I don't have that right now, I don't feel comfortable borrowing or taking money from someone, being a further burden on someone and starting a business. So he said, well, there's only one other job that it's okay for people of our family to engage in. And that was to be a shepherd. Because shepherding wasn't just a job. Shepherding was training. You learn being a shepherd. And the Prophet ﷺ later would actually tell us every single prophet and messenger that was sent at one point in time in their lives served as a shepherd, shepherded animals. And looked after animals. Goats and sheep and livestock. And the benefit in that was that you learned how to care for a flock. You learned how to be patient yet diligent. And so the Prophet ﷺ, so the Quraysh had this understanding that this is a noble job that uh, teaches character. So the Prophet ﷺ started working as a shepherd. And he's a young man and he continues on working, gathering up some money. And eventually he goes into the marketplace as a young man of 18, 19. He was about 14, 15 years old when he starts working as a young shepherd. And at, at the age of about 18, 19, he actually ventures into the marketplace. He's got a little bit of money to get started and he initially worked as a broker. Where he didn't have enough money to again buy and sell goods. But what he was doing was that he was brokering deals between other merchants and businessmen. He would introduce buyers and sellers to one another and get paid a commission. Which is hard work, but it's good work. And the Prophet ﷺ started working in this manner. And he would immediately, instantly became known for his honesty and he developed a reputation for his integrity. And that's where that title started to develop, as Sadiq Al-Ameen. Do you have anybody you'd recommend? For me to hire as a broker for my merchandise. I just came back with a caravan full of all these goods from Syria. From Sham. Do you have anybody you'd recommend? For me to hire as, a, as an agent. Who can help me find some buyers. And immediately they said there's a young man. A Shab. A Sadiq. Al Amin. There's a truthful. Trustworthy. Honorable young man. That I definitely would recommend. And that was basically the Prophet ﷺ. So he started engaging in this job, in this, um, in this work. And eventually it led him to the point where now he's earned enough money to start buying and selling goods on his own. And now he was officially into the marketplace as a businessman. And he worked very, very diligently and he worked very hard. He became known for his hardworking reputation because again, he would never ever dare earn a single penny in an unlawful means, by undercutting somebody else's business, by underselling or short-selling someone, never, never. So he worked hard, but he worked correctly. And he engaged in business in this manner until finally, he received a business proposition. And who did he receive a business proposition from? He received a business proposition from a woman by the name of Khadija, 
bint Huwailid. Now let's switch on over and understand who this woman is. Because we're going to pick up the story from here. So Khadija was a very, again, respectable woman. She again came from nobility. She was from a very good family in Quraysh. Her father, Khuwailid, was actually quite revered as a leader in Mecca. There's, there's a story that's narrated. The, the authenticity, the narration is a little weak, but nevertheless it talks about the fact that there was an individual in Mecca who in one point in time, due to some type of beef or some type of conflict that he had with some of the leaders of Quraysh, he basically wanted to snatch, he wanted to steal the al hajr al-Aswad, the black stone, that's the sacred uh, relic that we have there in Mecca at the Kaaba. He wanted to rob that, he wanted to steal that and take it to Yemen. And some, some speculation is there that he was actually hired to do so. Now, when he was hired to do so and he was about to set out on this plan, Khuwailid, the father of Khadija, he grabbed a few individuals and basically went there when they found out about his plan and stood guard there at the Mecca, said, no, 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 absolutely not. We're not going to allow you to take this from the Kaaba, from Baytullah, a Sharif. We're not going to let you take this and desecrate and violate, vandalize the Kaaba. And they defended the Kaaba. So he was known for such acts of nobility. And, and guarding the sanctity of the city of Mecca. So he's a very respectable man. And her uncle was also known as a leader amongst his people, Amr ibn al-Aswad. And so now at this particular time, we're talking about this woman Khadija. So she was, her mother was also from a family of nobility. She was from the lineage of Amr bin Luay, uh, Luhay, and her father was also from honorable, noble lineage as well. And so she was born into this very respectable family. She grew up with a high level education. She was very cultured, very sophisticated. She was known to be very elegant, very beautiful, very sharply intelligent. And it said that she had been married twice before. She had been married twice before. Unfortunately, or rather in, in the sense we can say fortunately because it eventually led her to the Prophet ﷺ. But in either case, both of her previous husbands had actually passed away. She was widowed twice. So the reason why I say unfortunately is it must have obviously caused her a lot of pain to lose two of her husbands. And it's again mentioned in loosely in some books of history that she had three previous children. She had two sons from her very first husband by the name of Hala and Hind which were typically regarded or uh, considered female names, feminine names. But nevertheless, she had two sons, and that was what her first husband, Ma uh, Malik, what he was known as, he was known as Abu Hala. And then her second husband, she had a daughter from her second husband by the name of Hinda. So Hala, Hind, and Hinda. In either case, she's been widowed twice, and at this particular time, due to just what she inherited from her own father, there's some different narrations that say that her father was still alive, but most more authentic narrations say her father had passed away and her mother had passed away. Due to what she had inherited from her parents and her, both of her husbands who had also passed away, and then she had very intelligently, because she was very, very intelligent, she had very sharply, very intelligently, she had invested that money and started a business. And her business flourished. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed her business and she eventually became a very wealthy woman. And she was known by titles in Mecca. Some of the folks of Mecca referred to her as uh, the princess of Mecca. Amira to Mecca, Amira to Quraysh, the princess of Quraysh. Some of them referred to her as Khadija al-Kubra, the great Khadija. So she was known by these different titles and she was very, very well respected amongst her people because not only just simply because of her wealth, wealth came later. She was primarily respected amongst her people because she was an intelligent, elegant um, woman of great ethics and morality. And so she was respected for her character above everything else. Now you're already starting to see some things line up. Now at this particular time, there's a little bit of a difference of narration. What do we typically know? How old was Khadija when she married the Prophet ﷺ, when she came across the Prophet ﷺ? How old was she? 
40. That's what the popular narration says, and that is an authentic narration. There are some other narrations that place her age a little bit younger, such as there's a narration from Ibn Abbas that says that she was 28 years old. Some say that she was 35 years old. In either case, the popular narration and the most widely accepted narration is that she was 40 years old at this particular time. Now she was looking to hire someone to go into business with. She wasn't looking to hire an employee. She wanted to hire a partner, Mudaraba, what is called in the Arabic language, and it was actually preserved. This was the Prophet ﷺ's first experience in Mudaraba, and he actually later on, decades later, would preserve this as an Islamic practice and would encourage this type of business because it is a very good, equitable, fair type of conducting business, and that is you go into a partnership. Instead of lending money and borrowing money from people and to people, because that's a system of usury and interest which leads to either complete loss or complete gain on one side or the other. It's a high risk, high reward type of situation and that's not, that creates oftentimes, more often than not, it creates suffering amongst people and creates imbalance in the socio-economic order. But mudaraba is a type of business where you go into business together. One person might have money, the other person has the ability or the time and they basically become partners in their business and both will share the profits and both will share the losses. And so she was looking for a partner. And she was asking around, I need a partner, I want a partner. Obviously because of being a woman, I cannot go out and travel all the way to Sham and conduct my business myself. So I need somebody that's trustworthy, that isn't going to try to take advantage of me because I'm a woman back at home in Mecca and is going to think that he can rob me or that he can swindle me for my money. So I need somebody respectable. And she eventually was referred to Abu Talib, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ. Now the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, Abu Talib, was extremely protective of the Prophet ﷺ. And up till this point, he himself had, had preferred that the Prophet ﷺ not travel outside of Mecca um, without need and necessity. But the, Abu Talib realizing that Muhammad is a grown man now, He's 25 years old. He wants to go out and make a living and be a respectable businessman and settle down and start a family. He actually tells Khadija that if you are asking for a reference, this might seem a little biased, but you will never find anyone more trustworthy than my nephew. Ask around. And the second that she asked around, she immediately was told, Muhammad, you mean as sadiq al-Amin, the truthful and the trustworthy. And so she calls for a meeting with the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ goes to her and they basically sit down and discuss the business proposition and they agree to the business terms that the Prophet ﷺ will go on her behalf as a partner and will go there, buy the goods and sell the goods or whatever, make whatever exchange of merchandise that needs to be done and then come back with the profits. So now that he basically sets out. Khadija sends a servant of hers by the name of Maysara on this business trip. Just to kind of accompany him, help him out, give him a hand, and also just make sure everything is on the up and up. Not that she didn't trust the Prophet ﷺ, but at the same time, this is only intelligence. Even the Quran tells us, when you go into a business deal, then write down your contract, write down your terms, make a couple of witnesses. Not because I don't trust you that I'm doing business with you, Obviously, I wouldn't do business with you if I didn't trust you. That would be foolish to do business with somebody you don't trust. But you document things. You make witnesses. So similarly, she sends a servant of hers. Now they go on this trip, and it's a longer story. Maybe another story for another day, inshallah. But he sees a lot of very interesting things. Number one, he sees his integrity. He sees his honesty. Then he also witnesses some miraculous events where he sees clouds providing shade over his head. The Prophet ﷺ stops at a place and takes shade under a tree. And then this monk wanders up and basically is like, who is this man? And Maysara says, that's Muhammad ibn Abdullah, al-Qurashi, al-Hashimi. That's a man of Quraysh, ibn Hashim, by the name of Muhammad, the son of Abdullah. And he says, no, 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 you're mistaken. Because I have it written in scripture that the man that will sit down under the shade of this tree at this particular point in time will actually be a prophet of the last and the final times. 
will be the prophet of last times. Nabi Akhir is Zaman. And Maysar is blown away. And then he sees clouds providing shade over his head and all these different miraculous things. He witnesses trees bending down to provide a shade over the Prophet ﷺ while he's resting under the shade of a tree and the sun moves, so the shade moves. But he sees the branches of the tree shifting to continue to provide shade for the Prophet ﷺ. And Maysar is blown away. Eventually they come back to Mecca and the Prophet ﷺ has made twice the profit that Khadija anha has ever made on any of her business investments. And so she's equally impressed by just the sheer barakah and the blessing of this business transaction. Then she asks Maysara, what did you find? And he says, this is by and far the most noble man I've ever dealt with. I've never seen character like his. He is honest, he is trustworthy, he is considerate, he is caring, high and noble character. And then on top of that, he says, and by the way, between the two of us, I've seen some unbelievable things. Now at this particular juncture, some narrations mention that they actually did a couple of more business deals. Because everybody's making money, why not? So they do a couple of more business deals and they grow very comfortable in doing business together. And it's, it's profitable for both. There's a lot of trust. There's no fear of any like uh, cheating going on in terms of business. And so they continue doing business and eventually um, the narrations mention that one of Khadija radiallahu anha, Khadija, one of her friends by the name of Nafisa, one of Khadija's friends by the name of Nafisa, all right, she comes to Khadija and she says, how's business been going? And she says, never been better, it's amazing. Really? What, how, why, why is it working out so well? You know, I found this business partner, Muhammad, young man, honest, noble, high character, amazing young man. And it's just been, there's been nothing wrong, nothing to complain about, it's awesome. So she says, you know Khadija, you've been single for quite some time now. It's been a while since your second husband passed away. You, you need to get remarried. You need to think about getting married again. And what I should mention on the side here is that because of Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha being who she was, she was extremely sought after. She was receiving proposals every single day. At the same time, on the other side, the Prophet ﷺ, there are actually the books of Sirah, Ibn Ishaq, Al-Waqidi, many, many historians, scholars of the Sirah, the prophetic biography mentioned, even the Prophet ﷺ was receiving marriage proposals now. He's a young man, great character, noble character, comes from a great background, um, and now he's very successful in business, he's doing well, making money. He was receiving marriage proposals as well. And his heart just wasn't settled with any one of the proposals he was receiving. So every day it was almost, and there's even a narration where Abu Talib kind of has a talk with him too. He's like, you keep turning down proposals. Come on, man, you're making my life difficult. They're breaking my door down. Come on, you got to say yes. And so now they're both receiving marriage proposals. And here Khadija's friend Nafisa says, Khadija, you got to think about getting married. And she's like, yeah, you know, I, I have thought about it. I just, just... It, It'll take the right person. Listen, I've been there twice. It would have to be the right person. And so now, her friend Nafisa says, that what about Muhammad? And Khadija radiallahu anha responds by saying, you know what? I've actually been considering it as well. It seems like it would make for a very, very good proposal. And in fact, some of, some of what she says to her friend uh, Nafisa, what Khadija says to her friend, who's suggesting the proposal from the Prophet wasallam, some of that is actually mentioned uh, in the narrations as well. That she says that, I have thought about him. I, not, I know not only him, but I know his family as well. He is extremely well respected amongst his people. وَأَمَانَتُهُ His honesty and trustworthy, uh, trustworthiness is well known. وَحُسْنُ خُلُقِهِ His beautiful character is witnessed and experienced by everyone. وَصِدْقِ حَدِيثِهِ 
He's always honest and noble in his speech. And so I don't find, you know, th this, this would be an ideal proposal. But how do I go about in doing this? So her friend says, let me handle this. All right, this is the first matchmaking auntie of all time, okay? Everybody knows what I'm talking about? It's the first matchmaking auntie in the history of Islam, okay? All right, so she says, let me handle this. I got this. So she goes to the Prophet wasallam, and she says, have you considered Khadija? And she says that, she comes from a very, very noble family. She is one of the most dignified and honorable of the women of Quraysh. She is blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with numerous blessings in her, life, in her life. Would you consider a proposal from Khadija? And the Prophet says, of course. What better proposal could there be than someone like Khadija? The nobility of Khadija, the character of Khadija, the integrity of Khadija. So the Prophet ﷺ says, I need to go and talk to my uncle about this. I need to go and consult with him. And so you find a balance here. The Prophet ﷺ is a man. A lot of times, you know, we, we, we deal with this marriage situation where we got these 25-year-old uh, mommy's boys um, who can't even wash their own like socks themselves. The Prophet ﷺ is a man, all right? He's been working since the age of 14. He's been shepherding sheep and goats. He's been running around in the marketplace as a broker. He started off investing very, very small and buying little merchandise and selling it here and there. He's built himself up from scratch and he's supporting his uncle and helping his uncle out financially. So don't get this wrong. In fact, in fact, the Prophet ﷺ very soon would even take the youngest child of his uncle Ali bin Abi Talib and raise him himself to ease his uncle's load. So he's a man, don't get that mistaken. But at the same time, a man, being a man also means that he respects and recognizes the fact that my uncle, both my parents were gone and my uncle raised me since the age of eight and looked after me like one of his own, cared for me more than he cared for his own children. I'm going to go and just go off and get married and show up one day and be like, guess what? Surprise, surprise. Like, no, it doesn't work that way. I have to consult with him. I have to talk to him. You know, like we say, quote unquote, get his blessing. You know, talk to him, consult with him, shura. Get his advice, his counsel. He's got wisdom. He's got knowledge. He's got experience. And more than everything, he loves me. He loves me so much, like a child of his own. And so he goes to his uncle Abu Talib and he says, Ya Ammi, my dear beloved uncle, this proposal from Khadija has come to me. And Abu Talib again says, it's a great proposal. And so now he says, we need to make this official. So Abu Talib and the narrations mentioned that Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu was there as well. The uncle of the Prophet sallallahu who's also his milk brother, brother through Rada'a. He was nursed, they were nursed by the same woman, Thuwayba, the slave that used to belong to Abu Lahab. So Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu is with them as well. Because he was an uncle to the Prophet but they were very close in age. They grew up together, so he was kind of like that young, cool uncle of the Prophet Who was also very protective of the Prophet kind of like as a younger brother. So Hamza and uh, Abu Talib, they go. Some narrations even mention that Abbas is also there, another uncle of the Prophet And they go to the uncle of Khadija, and they basically officially, properly, respectfully propose. Here's our young man, Muhammad, who would like to marry your niece and this respectable woman of your family, Khadija. And they all agree to the proposal and they decide to go ahead and get married. And some of the narrations mention that the Prophet some, however, doesn't hesitate in regards to the proposal, but says, you know, I need a little bit of time to kind of get some things ready for marriage, financial responsibilities, respectfully I need to present a mahar, a marriage gift to my wife, sadaq mahar, right? So I'm going to need some time to get ready. And Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha says, none of that is necessary. We don't need any of that. None of this fancy schmancy business. What we're looking for is happiness. To share a life together. And so they are able to expedite the marriage. All right, young people want to get married. You want to get married quick? You want to get married fast? Then stop thinking about doing that, you know, $80,000 wedding. 
And you can absolutely get married quick and you can get married fast. All right, so do what's within your grasp and your control. We don't want to sacrifice that. So the Prophet ﷺ, Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, fix a date for marriage very soon. And they get together and the Prophet ﷺ presents the mahr, the sadaq of 20 camels. And again, 20 camels isn't nothing to really scoff at. So again, there's that fine balance in the life of the Prophet ﷺ where it's not extravagant. It's not extravagant. But at the same time, he's not, a, he's not you know, cheapening out over here either. 20 camels, young camels, which basically, I, I don't even know how to estimate it, but you could probably price that at at least $20,000. So that's the mahr, the sadaq that he offers, very respectable. Because you also have to identify who you are, where you're at in life, and also who you're proposing to, who you're trying to marry. And so he offers this as the mahr, as a gift, and they get together and then they basically have a feast where the official marriage proposal, the ijab in the qubul, right, where he proposes and she accepts the proposal, all of that is done and conducted. Some narrations mention that it was the uncle of Khadija who oversaw the marriage, Amr, and some narrations mention that it was actually the brother of Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha um, who oversaw uh, the marriage and basically accepted the marriage proposal and kind of gave Khadija away uh, in marriage into the marriage of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So there's narrations of both effects um, in this situation. There's a very, I don't know, there's, there's a very interesting narration that talks about, but it's, it's declared as being weak by a lot of the scholars because the... The father of Khadija radiallahu anha, Khuwaylid, it's established that he had passed away before this time, but there's a narration that talks about that when they do actually get together for the wedding, and her father is there to give her away, uh, give her hand in marriage to the Prophet wasallam, that during the party or whatever, he becomes intoxicated, and after a while he... See, kind of passes out, wakes up and sees a party going on. He's like, what's this party going on? It's like, uh, your daughter just got married. And he's like, I don't remember marrying my daughter off. And they're like, you just did. And so then the Prophet ﷺ comes to talk to him. And then he's like, well, I don't remember doing it. But even if I didn't, all right, now you're married. So uh, it's just an interesting story that basically everybody's got in-law drama, okay? It's not something new. Even the Prophet ﷺ had to deal with a little bit of drama from his in-laws. But it's a weak narration. So either way, either the uncle of Khadija radiallahu anha, uh, Amr ibn Asad, excuse me, Amr ibn Asad gives her away in marriage or that it was her brother who gives her away into the marriage. Amr ibn Khuwaylid, of the, he gives her away into the marriage of the Prophet ﷺ. So now they basically get married and they settle down with a the family. They start a family together. Now let me, I'm going to tell you two things about the next part of their life before we transition on to the major event, of course, of their life that they did together, that they conducted together. So I'm going to tell you two things about this next phase of their life. Number one, is that they were married very happily, very, you know, they enjoyed nothing but happiness and good times for their entire marriage of 25 years. They were married for 25 years. And we're going gonna, we're gonna to go through those 25 years and understand what happened in the course of 25 years. The first 10 years, the first 10 years, one very fascinating thing from the life of the Prophet ﷺ, when you read the books of Sirah, and I'm talking about the most classical, the most detailed, the most detail-oriented, most authoritative books of the prophetic biography, when you read them, you read about the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, getting married at the age of 25. But then something remarkable, something very interesting happens. The next major historical event that is recorded in the life of the Prophet ﷺ is at the age of 35. And that event is when the Quraysh, there was a flood in Mecca, and the Kaaba was somewhat damaged, and they needed to renovate the Kaaba, the Baytullah, the sacred house of God in Mecca. The renovation of the Kaaba. In which we know the Prophet ﷺ played a major role, correct? 
For those who might not remember real quickly, once they're renovating the Kaaba and they get it all together and put together and everything's good to go, now they need to put the black stone, Al-Hajr Al-Aswad, back into its proper place. Now a dispute breaks out. Well, who's going to have the honor of doing so? So they're arguing, they're fighting, the different families are saying, we get it, we get it, and everyone's getting bent out of shape, and some people are about to draw their swords, some people are starting to push and shove each other, yell and scream at each other. Everyone wants this honor of holding the black stone in their hands and putting it back into their place for God knows how long. It's been centuries, it's been generations since the Al-Hajr al-Aswad was last moved. Because the renovation had been done for a very long time, a few generations. So now this dispute is breaking out. So what do they do? How do you go about handling this situation? So finally, some narrations even say that somebody had a dream. And some narrations say that it was just kind of occurred to somebody, a wise old man, who said that, all right, this is what we're going to do. This is not going to get settled between us. Everyone's going to keep fighting. It's not the way to do this. The next person that walks through that door, two narrations. One narration says he will put, the, put it back into place. Second narration says he will decide who will put it back into place. All right? So they're all basically now sitting there, you know, just biting their nails, cracking their knuckles. They're all nervous and fidgety. Who's going to walk through that door? And everybody's hoping that some moron doesn't walk through the door. And next thing you know, the best case scenario, Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam walks through that door. And the narration mentions when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam walks through the door, everybody inside the Kaaba just let out a sigh of relief. They were like, oh, thank God. Whew, that was a close one. Right? Good thing it wasn't that Abu Jahl guy, right? So uh, every, everybody's relieved. Like, man, good, good thing it was him. And so then they're like, they rush up to the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ was coming for his daily tawaf of the Kaaba, where he would come, do tawaf around the Kaaba, just meditate, connect with the Kaaba, think on, you know, just life and all of its realities and its truths. And so they all surround him. They all huddle up around him. He's like, what's going on? So, you know, we've been doing the, reno, the renovation of the Kaaba. And he's like, yeah. It's like, well, we need to find a way to put this stone back into place. And eventually, to summarize, the Prophet ﷺ suggests a beautiful plan. He takes his own shawl, his own blessed shawl, and he says, hold corner, the corners of it. Put the stone, he picks up the stone and puts it in the middle of the shawl. And he says, now lift up the shawl all the way up to where the stone is placed. And then he picks it up with his blessed hands and he puts it into place. And everyone's happy and everything's good to go. That happened when he was 35 years old, 10 years after he was married. The interesting thing to me is that at 25 he gets married, then there's no major event. And when I say major event, of course he receives prophethood revelation at 40. So I'm not talking about revelation, but I'm talking about in terms of maybe something in the community. Something major event in terms of business or life or community or politics or something. There's no other major event recorded for a decade. And we know the Prophet ﷺ is intelligent, talented, respected, sought after for all different types of roles in his community. Then why is he not majorly involved in any type of endeavor in his community for 10 years? Well, because he was involved in the most important task. And that was building a home and building a family. He has just gotten married. He was spending time with his wife. They were having kids. They were raising a family. They were raising beautiful children. I mean, we talk about Zainab and Umm Kulthum and Ruqayya and Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anhunna. Right? We talk about these noble, illustrious women. They didn't just materialize out of thin air. But they were the product of prophetic tarbiyah. The, pro the prophetic upbringing. So he spent time with his kids. He sat with his kids. He played with his kids. He fed his kids, tucked them in at night, talked to them, spoke to them, played with them. That's what the Prophet ﷺ invested a decade of his life into. 
See, when the Prophet ﷺ, and you notice divine revelation is given at 40, and most of his kids are grown up at that time. And the Prophet ﷺ, especially in the Medinan era, where now he's an elderly man, his children are all grown up, all married. He's got grandchildren now. And we see the emphasis that he places on family all the time. Talks about the importance of marriage, the rights of the spouse, raising your children, spending time at home, being a good family person. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا He didn't just, he didn't preach without practicing. وَالْعَيَاذُ بِاللَّهِ He led by example. He had raised a beautiful family, focused on his family and his children. And then he preached to the community to do the same. So it's very important to understand this time of the Prophet Sallallahu life. So now the next 15 years of his marriage, from the time of when he was 25 years old, the 15 years of their life together, Muhammad and Khadija, radiallahu ta'ala anhumah, alright, they had six children during this time. Six children. The first of their children was a boy by the name of Al-Qasim. And that's where the kunniya, the nickname of the Prophet Sallallahu Abu Al-Qasim comes from. Again, very tragically, Qasim reached the age of a year and basically passed away before his second birthday. So it was a very tragic loss for this, this couple. Secondly, they had a daughter by the name of Zainab who, lived, who grew up and lived a full life. She got married, she had children, etc. Their third child, second daughter, was by the name of Umm Kulthum who would later on be married to the famous Khalifa, companion of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, by the name of Uthman Mu'affan, radiallahu anhu, may Allah be pleased with him. The third daughter and fourth child that they had was a girl by the name of Ruqayya, they named her Ruqayya. And she would also grow up. Um, and after Umm Kulthum would pass away very tragically, very young, she would fall very ill and she would die then Ruqayya would, become, would be married later on to Uthman ibn Affan. And then their fifth child, their fourth daughter, was a girl by the name of Fatima. Fatima. Who again was the only child of the Prophet ﷺ who outlived him. And she passed away six months after he passed away. And she would have children, she would have two sons by the name of Hassan and Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhumah. And they would be just the heart and soul of the Prophet sallallahu He loved them so much. And then finally his sixth child, which was his second son, was, the name of, was by the name of Abdullah. And Abdullah, a lot of times there's confusion some historians, some uh, writers of the seerah have said that the Prophet ﷺ had a th another son from Khadija, a third son with Khadija, by the name of Tahir. And that's actually a mistake, because Abdullah, he was known by the nickname of at tahir And the reason why he was called Tahir was he was born after Revelation came. He was born after Revelation came, and so that's why he was known as at tahir that he was born in the era of revelation. And he also passed away very, very young. Some narrations even mention that he, was, he passed away while still an infant. And again, it was very tragic for them. The Prophet ﷺ did have a seventh child, a third son, who would also pass away while he was still young by the name of Ibrahim. But that would be later on from another one of his spouses, from another one of his wives, Maria Qibtiya. So this, this, these were the six children that him and Khadija had together. And they had two sons, four daughters. Both sons passed away very, very young as babies. And the four daughters would outlive their mother, Khadija. Now the Prophet ﷺ reaches the age of about, you can say, 38 or 39. And they've built a beautiful home and a, they, they, they have a beautiful family. This couple has grown together deeply in love. There are some narrations that talk about the, the Khadija that she never, they never argued, they never fought. They never had any difficulty or adversity with one another. It was peace and happiness, love and affection, kindness and mercy and forgiveness. 
And when he reached the age of 38, 39, the Prophet ﷺ had a very interesting experience. He started to see dreams at night. He started to have dreams at night. And what would happen is the next day, the dream would come true. Like whatever he saw in his dream would occur in the next day. And then, so the first time you're like, okay. Then the second time, third time, fourth time, and it became a daily event. So much so that he just expected it. And that was to get him to just kind of trust his heart. To be comfortable with having knowledge, with being given knowledge that was not available, was not possible to be attained anywhere else. And once that started to happen, then he really started to reflect and deep think, uh, very, you know, think very deeply. And that's when the Prophet ﷺ decided, I need to kind of get some time away. I need some time to reflect. I need some time to just invest into just some deep thought, deep reflection. Get away from the noise. And that's when he tells his wife, and he's been telling her, I have these dreams, and whatever I see comes true the next day. And she tells him, don't worry, just trust your heart. Everything has a purpose and a reason. Oh, I forgot to mention one thing, very interesting thing. When she receives a proposal from the Prophet ﷺ, when that old proposal happened, back then, 15 years before this conversation, she saw a dream. So first, her servant Maysara tells her that I saw all these miraculous things, clouds providing shade, trees providing shade, this monk saying what he said. And then she saw a dream that she walks out of her, out of her home into the courtyard of her house. So there's kind of like an open space, almost like a front yard. But the front yard would have the wall around it so that you would have privacy. So she walks out of the home, out of the door into the courtyard, and she sees that the sun descends down into, her, into the courtyard and fills her entire home with light. And this is right around the time when she receives the report from her servant about the Prophet ﷺ and what he was like on that business trip. So she goes to her cousin by the name of Waraka bin Nofal, who was a Bible scholar. He was one of the few people amongst the Arabs who was knowledgeable about the Bible. He was Christian, you know, uh, Bible scholar. And he was actually translating the Bible into Arabic and trying to preach Christianity amongst the Arab tribes. So he comes... She goes to him and she says, you know about some of this type of stuff. This is the report I got about this man I've been doing business with. And then I see this dream. And now I've got a marriage proposal from him as well. I just need to consult with you. And that's when Muraqa bin Nofil says that if the monk said that about him, then that means that he is destined to become that prophet of the last times. And this, the, just the dream that you had of the sun descending down into your courtyard and filling your home with light, that is a sign of great blessing, divine blessing coming into your home. Say yes to the proposal. So you can't forget that fact that that's in the mind of Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. She's ready to support her husband. So now he tells her, I'm having these dreams. And she says, it's all good. It's all for a purpose. Just trust what's going on. Then he comes to her and tells her, I need some time to reflect, to think. I need to get away for a little bit. And she says, absolutely. How long do you need to go for? At least a couple of days. I'm going to go find a nice spot in the mountains, not too far away. But I need a secluded, nice spot where I can go and I can reflect. She packs him together some food, some supplies, some clothes, and sends him off very lovingly. And the Prophet ﷺ goes outside of Mecca, finds a mountain by the name of Nur, Jabal Nur. And there he finds a small cave by the name of Hira, Ghar Hira. And he actually chose that spot because when he sat at the mouth of the cave, he could see the Kaaba from there. And he sits down and he begins to meditate and reflect and pray and think over here. And he would be gone for a few days at a time and he would come back down and go back home, spend a few weeks at home, a month or so at home, then pack up some stuff and then go again. And this way he would kind of come and go, take a few days here and there. One time it mentions that he was gone and Khadija helped him pack the stuff that he was taking. So she knew exactly how much food he had. And when they go, when he goes, she realizes that he's been gone longer than what he had food for. 
So she packs some food and some supplies together and she actually goes outside of Mecca and climbs up the mountain and the Prophet ﷺ is sitting at the opening of the cave and he sees her and says, what are you doing here? And she says, I got worried about you. I want to make sure that you were okay. I brought some food for you. So this is what their relationship was like, one of understanding and facilitating and providing and accommodating one another. So we know of that blessed day when the Prophet ﷺ receives divine revelation. And so now the Prophet ﷺ comes back down from the cave. And he comes home. And he's shaking and trembling, overwhelmed by this profound experience. Unlike anything any a human being has ever experienced. There, has been, there have been many a messenger and prophet before him, but he just received the Qur'an. Most powerful experience any human being's ever had. So he's overwhelmed, shaking and trembling. And he comes home and he tells his beloved wife, Khadija radiallahu anha, Dathiruni, Dathiruni, Zambiluni, Zambiluni, Cover me, wrap me up in a blanket, in a shawl. Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha wraps him up and covers him up. And then she asks him that, tell me what happened. Tell me what happened. And the Prophet ﷺ tells her the entire experience. That this angel, he came to me. And he said the following words to me. And he recites the Qur'an to her. And tells him of the divine responsibility that has been placed on his shoulder. Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, the wife of the Prophet now we see what marriage, what it really culminates in. She sits down next to him. She takes his hand. She looks him in the eyes. And this is what she says to him. This is how she defines 15 years of marriage. Six children later. The death of two of those children. Everything they've been through. Listen to what she has to say. This is her summary of her husband. This is how she explains and defines him. She says, Kalla wallahi. She says, Absolutely nothing to worry about. I swear to God. La yukhzika Allahu abadan. God will never ruin you. He will never abandon you. Why am I so confident in saying this? What do I know about you? After 15 years of sharing morning and evening, day and night, after sharing a life with you, what can I say about you? Innaka la tasilur rahim. Innaka la tasilur rahim. You're a good family man. You take care of your family. You love your family. Wa tuqri wa taqri ad you honor your guest. Somebody shows up at your doorstep, you go above and beyond any type of social obligation to honor somebody who comes at your door. kalla. You look for people. You look for people. You go out searching for people who have fallen through the cracks, who are overlooked and neglected and downtrodden by society, and you go and you grab them by the hand and lift them back up. وَتَكْسِبُ maadum. You go and give to those people who can't, you take care of those people who can't take care of themselves. You look for those people. وَتُعِينُ عَلَى نَوَائِبِ And you are always the first one waiting there, whenever there's a good cause. That's who you are. There's no way that God would ever abandon you. That God would ever forsake you. I refuse to believe it. Think about the conviction she has. What is her husband telling her? And think about his honesty and his character and his integrity and his nobility. That she would literally, she would follow him to the moon. She would trust him no matter what. And that she said that, I have no doubts about the fact that this is the truth. 
and that this is good. Because this is who you are. And then the Prophet ﷺ tells her, that's fine. But who will believe this message? And she says, I believe this message. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu annaka rasulullah. And then she even helps him. However she can, whatever she knows. She takes him to her cousin, Waraqa bin Nawfal. She said, he knows. He talks about this type of stuff. He talks about prophets and revelation and angels and God and divine inspiration. He talks about this stuff. I'll do what I can. And she takes the Prophet ﷺ to her cousin and introduces them. And the Prophet ﷺ talks to Waraqa bin Nawfal and he says, you are the Prophet. I wish I could be there when your people will oppose you. I would help you and I would aid you and I would support you. And I would stand by your side if that day would come. And that's why Waraqa bin Nawfal is considered a believer. He said, yes, you are the Prophet of God. This is the truth. Now what happens at this particular point in juncture? Something very, very beautiful. The Prophet ﷺ, alright, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided the Prophet ﷺ a way, a means to be comfortable with the responsibility and the message that he was given. To find some strength and some conviction. To strengthen and nourish his soul. And the Qur'an definitely is nourishment for the soul. But something the Prophet ﷺ himself could engage in. Something he could access. To provide him comfort when he was looking for it. When he needed it most. And so Jibreel, the angel Gabriel, Jibreel comes to the Prophet ﷺ. Takes him with him. Strikes the earth. A springs comes forth from the earth and he says, this is from the well of Zamzam. This is an offshoot, a branch of the well of Zamzam being provided for you here. So that, and then he shows him wudu. Jibreel Alisam shows the Prophet ﷺ wudu. And then the Prophet ﷺ makes wudu. And then Jibreel stands up and shows him how to pray two rakahs. This is before the five times daily prayer. Just how to pray two rakahs. So that he can talk to Allah and pray when he needs it. إِذَا حَزَبَهُ أَمْرٌ فَزَعَ إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ Whenever any situation came up, he would immediately go to his prayer. Guess what the Prophet ﷺ does? With this new salah, this wudu, this purification and this prayer that he just learned, he rushes back home to his beloved wife. The first believer, his strongest supporter, his rock. He goes home to her and he grabs her by the hand and he says, Come on, I have to share something with you. I have to show you something. Amazing. And he takes her there, and they make wudu together. And then he stands up with her and he says, now follow after me. And he shows her how to pray and they pray together. And it is that day, later that night, when they are actually standing and praying together, when the nephew of the Prophet ﷺ, the son of that uncle who cared for him his entire life and raised him, Abu Talib, his son Ali, Ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he's a young boy, a young man at the age of 10. He sees them praying and he says, Mahada ya Muhammad, what are y'all doing? And the Prophet ﷺ explains to him, what is Iman and what are we doing? And he accepts Islam and becomes Muslim. And there's a narration about a man who would later on become Muslim. He says, I came in the very early, early days. The very early days. And outside of the house of the Prophet ﷺ, I saw this man, this handsome man, he comes and stands. And then this young boy comes and stands next to him. And then this very dignified woman, she comes and she stands behind them. And then he raises his hands and ties his hands and they do the same. And then he goes into ruku and do, they, they do the same. And then he goes into sujood, prostration, puts his face on the ground and they do the same. And I'm watching this and I'm just amazed. And I ask my host, whose name was Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet I say, hey, what's that? That's amazing, what is that? He says, you know who that is? He says, no, he goes, that's my nephew Muhammad. He says, you know who that woman is? He says, no, he says, that's his wife Khadija. And that boy, that's, her, that's my nephew. That's my nephew. Excuse me, I refer to Ali, is not the nephew of the Prophet, the cousin of the Prophet. Abbas says that, that's my nephew, Ali, the son of Abu Talib, my older brother. 
And they prayed together as a family. And from that point on, Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha stood by the side of the Prophet And every single time the Prophet had a difficult experience. When he stood up on the mountain of Safa and they, then Abu Lahab you know, curses him and talks bad about him and says rude and crude things to him. It was Khadija that the Prophet could go home to and that he could talk to and that he could confide in and that he could see comfort in. And not only did he see love in her eyes, but he saw faith in her eyes. And that reaffirmed the strength and the conviction of the Prophet ﷺ. This is what the Prophet ﷺ alluded to when he said that somebody who gets married, فَقَدْ إِسْتَكْمَلَ نِصْفَ الْإِيمَانِ That person has completed half their faith. When marriage and faith are intertwined, and your faith, you're unified, to, collective, together, the faith that you share. Your unified, collected faith, collective faith in Allah strengthens your love for one another, and your, faith, your love for one another continues to unify you in your devotion and dedication to Allah. That was the marriage of the Prophet ﷺ and Khadija. That's that love story. And so, now what happens? Khadija radiallahu ta'ala and the Prophet ﷺ had money, had wealth. And they realized that many poor people in Mecca, slaves in Mecca, are accepting Islam. And they start spending their money. The Prophet ﷺ can't take out time anymore to go on business trips and go and make more money. He's got to preach, he's got to teach. He's got to spread the message far and wide. And Khadija every single morning wakes up and is standing there with him at the door telling him, go out there and spread this message far and wide. And on top of that, on the other side, while he can't go out and do business anymore, there are constantly slaves who need freeing, who've become Muslim and are being tortured because they're Muslim. So they need to be freed. So they're spending their own money freeing these slaves, feeding the poor, looking after people, sending people off to Habasha, to East Africa, to escape persecution, to go and live there in freedom and in safety. They spend their money. In sending these people off, making sure they're okay. Finally, the time comes where eventually a lot happens during this time. Over the next six, seven years, a lot happens. And they finally, the Meccans, the Quraysh, the opposition to the message of the Prophet ﷺ, they decide that the only way to really handle and curb this issue is to boycott Muhammad, his family, and his followers, and his supporters. Kick them out from Mecca, and isolate them, and boycott them. So Abu Talib rounds up the clan. All the believers, all the followers, all the supporters, including the Prophet ﷺ, his beloved wife Khadija, and their children. And they go into the Shi'ab of Abu Talib. A place, some property, some land Abu Talib had outside of Mecca. And they are isolated there for three years. Nobody will do business with them. Nobody will trade with them. Nobody will lend them any money. Nobody will provide them any food. Nobody will deal with them in any way, shape or form. Nobody will show them any kindness. And they spent three years like this. Days would go by where people wouldn't have food to eat and water to drink. Babies would cry because they were hungry and their mothers would cry because they hadn't eaten anything to be able to nurse their babies. Children died, babies died. There were graves of babies and children. Many, many people died during this time. Dozens of graves were dug during this time. The cries and the screams of women crying over the passing of babies and children could be heard all the way into Mecca. People became sick malnourished, very, very ill. Until finally, through again, the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, miraculous means, the boycott was lifted. And everybody came back into Mecca. And it said that during this time, Khadija, who was a lot older now, she, came, she became very sick and very ill. And they came back from this boycott in the Shia of Abi Talib, and she passed away a few months later. And that harshness of those three years 
Not just the physical harshness, harshness, but the emotional difficulty. Watching these people struggle, caring for them, loving them. She was like a mother to all of them. Her heart just couldn't bear it. And a couple of months later, she was bedridden for a few months. And the Prophet ﷺ was so distraught this entire time. Until finally one day she breathed her last and she passed away. You know, a real tragedy for us is when we read Sirah, when we talk about the life of the Prophet ﷺ, we jump straight from the death of Khadija right into his marriage to Aisha and then his marriage to Sauda. There are narrations which talk about the fact that the Prophet ﷺ was so devastated. He's a single father. Two of his daughters are not married. Fatima was quite young. She's a young girl. She was maybe 8, 10, 12 years old. And he was so devastated at the loss of his beloved wife Khadija. He actually didn't come out of his home. He just sat at home with his daughter recovering. Mourning. Healing. For a few days he was not seen outside. And when his family members came to see him, you could see the, 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 the streaks of tears on his face. Hugging his daughter sitting there. Trying to console his daughter at the loss of her mother. That it said that even Abu Lahab came to the door. He heard the Prophet ﷺ has not come outside for a few days. That he comes to the door of the Prophet ﷺ. And knocks the door, and when the Prophet ﷺ opens the door and he sees the face of the Prophet, ﷺ, Abu Lahab, who's actively been campaigning against the Prophet ﷺ for a decade, he sees the face of the Prophet ﷺ and he feels bad and he goes and he says, I'm not going to oppose my nephew anymore. Eventually, some of his cronies and his supporters and his troublemaking buddies, they eventually come to him and talk him out of it. And he goes back on this oath that he took and goes right back to opposing the Prophet ﷺ. But even his heart was softened even for a minute. A man like Abu Lahab, even his heart was softened when he looked at the pain and the anguish on the face of Rasulullah ﷺ. He loved her so much. And so yes, the Prophet ﷺ did eventually get remarried. A couple of years later, and yes, the Prophet ﷺ eventually left Mecca and migrated to Medina. And yes, eventually he established the most beautiful community this earth has ever seen. And yes, when eventually he had grandchildren and laughed again and smiled again and had a beautiful experience and happiness and joy in his life. But you know something very interesting? He never forgot Khadija. Never forgot Khadija. Never. Four years after she passed away. Four years after she passed away. It was the Battle of Badr. It's a longer story. But basically, his son-in-law was one of, one of the prisoners of war. He had come in the battle on the op opposition side and he was captured. So his daughter, eldest daughter Zainab, sends her necklace to secure the ransom of her husband. The Prophet ﷺ wasn't aware of Allah this situation. When the necklace is put before him, he sees that necklace and immediately knows where he's seen it before. This is Khadija's necklace. That she passed on to her daughter, her eldest daughter Zainab. And the second the Prophet ﷺ sees that necklace, tears start streaming down his face. Immediately, on contact. And the people around him are so taken aback by the immediate you know, onslaught, just a rush of emotions that the Prophet ﷺ is experiencing. Some of them begin to apologize and ask, is everything okay? And the Prophet ﷺ says, you guys did nothing. I just recognize this necklace. It belongs to my Khadija. 
she gave it to our daughter Zainab. And seeing this necklace reminds me of her. And of course the Prophet ﷺ requested the companions, if you don't mind, we'll release my son-in-law and send this necklace back to my daughter because that's all she's got of her mother Khadija. Seeing her necklace four years later would make him cry like that. One time the Prophet ﷺ is sitting at home and somebody brings a gift. And the Prophet ﷺ immediately tells one of the young Sahaba who used to like assist him, they would, you know, help the Prophet ﷺ run his errands and things like that. One of his young assistants, he tells them, All right, I need you to take this gift to such and such woman's house. And some of the family members of the Prophet ﷺ are like, Who's that? Such a nice gift, somebody sends it for you and you send it to, like, we're not sure, I mean, is there some, somebody we don't know about? Like, just, are you related to somebody we're not aware of? They sincerely are asking. And he says, no, that's one of Khadija's friends. I still like to send her gifts to respect Khadija's memory, to honor her memory. When you would sacrifice an animal like bring some meat into the house or you know cook some nice some nice food was cooked in the home of the prophet so he immediately would take some aside and say go give this to khadija's friends go take some food to them one time the prophet sallallahu is sitting at home and he hears a knock and it's a very distinct type of knock you know sometimes some people just kind of have it a, have a habit of knocking in a particular way like my kids, when they come to the door, they have a very particular way of ringing the doorbell. It's called non-stop, all right? <laughs> Sometimes they wait till I open the door and then they ring the bell while they look at me and laugh, right? So everyone's kind of got their own little thing that they do. So the Prophet Sassim hears a very distinct door knock that he recognizes, whatever it was. And he hears that, and that's the same way Khadija used to knock a door. Same way Khadija used to knock a door. And it was her sister, Hala. They grew up together. You know, sisters that are close in age, grow up together. You know, a lot of things they have in common, very, very similar. So, she used to knock the door the same way that her sister Khadija used to knock the door. And as soon as the Prophet ﷺ heard that knock, he jumped up and ran to the door saying, Allahumma Hala, Allahumma Hala. Allah, please let it be Hala, let it be Hala, let it be my sister-in-law Hala. And he opens the door and it's Hala, and he invites her in, sits her down, and they talk for hours about Khadija. Hours about Khadija. This is a decade after she passed away. Hours and hours. Remember that time she did this? Remember that time she did that? Remember how she used to say that? Remember how she used to do that? Remember how she used to do this? They would talk about Khadija for hours and hours and hours and hours. One of the later wives of the Prophet ﷺ, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, even remarked, she said, sometimes it seems like there's nobody else in this world besides Khadija. Like there's just nothing, nobody besides Khadija. It's all you talk about. Any little thing, yep, Khadija used to do that. You know what? Khadija used to do it just like that. That's how Khadija used to like to do it, all the time. One time some people asked the Prophet ﷺ, Tell us a little bit about Khadija. And the Prophet ﷺ, in one narration, he says, Ruziqtu hubbaha. Ruziqtu hubbaha. I was given rizq, rizq, sustenance, a gift from God. The roof over our head, the food that we eat, the air that we breathe, the years that we live, the minutes and the hours that we spend. Rizq. What we receive from Allah. Your rizq is written for you in the heavens and is sent to you by God from the heavens. He said, Ruziqtu. God sent me her love from the heavens. God gave me her love from the heavens. Her love was divine. Ruziqtu hubbaha. Wa kana li minha walad. She was the mother of my children. She was the love of my life and the mother of my children. That's who she was. 
In one narration, they asked her, tell us about Khadija, tell us about Khadija. Some young companions. And the Prophet ﷺ says, إِنَّهَا كَانَتْ وَكَانَتْ It's like saying she was and she just, she just was. Where do you want me to start? Where do I begin? I can't even put it into words. I don't even know what to tell you. She was so amazing. I can't explain it to you. You had to see her. You had to know her. You had to experience it to realize how amazing and remarkable she was. There's a beautiful passage. I'll end with a couple of things. There's a beautiful passage. Ibn Ishaq writes this. And it's just, it gets me every single time. Ibn Ishaq, who's one of the most noteworthy historians and scholars of the prophetic biography, he writes the following. I'm going to quote him verbatim. He says, وَآمَنَتْ خَدِيجَةُ بِنْتُ خُوَيْلِدْ Khadija, the daughter of Khuwaylid, she believed. وَصَدَّقَتْ بِمَا جَاءَهُ مِنَ اللَّهِ And she supported and she stated that everything that came to the Prophet ﷺ from God was the truth. وَوَازَرَتْهُ عَلَىٰ أَمْرِهِ She helped him and supported him in his mission. Wazir. She was his biggest, strongest, staunchest supporter. وَكَانَتْ أَوَّلَ مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ She was the first one. Whoever believed in Allah and the Messenger of Allah, Muhammad She's the first member of this Ummah. وَصَدَّقَ بِمَا جَاءَ مِنْهُ The first one to believe in the truth of Islam. فَخَفَّفَ اللَّهُ بِذَلِكَ عَنْ رَسُولِهِ Allah lightened, Allah, God, lightened the load of the Prophet through Khadija. She was the pillar that he could rest and support and lean on. لا يسمع شيئا يقرأه من رد عليه وتكذيب له فيحزنه ذلك إلا فرج الله عنه بها إذا رجع إليها تثبته وتخفف عليه وتصدقه وتهون عليه أمر الناس رضي الله عنها وأرضاها. Sorry to read that whole thing together, but it kind of fits together in Arabic. I'll translate it. He goes on to say, God lightened the load, eased the task of Muhammad ﷺ by means of Khadija. Whenever he heard anything that bothered him, when people rejected him, when they you know, reprimanded him, when they cursed him and sweared at him, and it would actually hurt him, it would cause him pain. He would go back home to Khadija and he would talk to Khadija. Allah would remove the grief, the sorrow, the concern, the pain from the Prophet ﷺ by means of Khadija reinforcing him and attesting to his truth and the fact that he is a prophet and he is a messenger and he speaks the truth. Every single time he dealt with some difficulty out there, he went back home to Khadija and Khadija was there to hold his hand and to look him in the eyes and to tell him, you are the prophet of Allah, you are the messenger of Allah, you preach the truth, you keep doing what you have to do. She was his pillar, she was his rock, his support. And that's why the Prophet there's so many narrations, so many beautiful narrations. I'll end with this one. One time, the Prophet ﷺ is sitting at home. Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha gets up and goes to, you know, the fire, the stove that's burning like right outside the door of the house. So she steps outside to go, you know, kind of check on whatever's cooking in the fire, the stove. Jibreel alayhi salam comes to the Prophet ﷺ. And he says to the Prophet ﷺ, here comes Khadija. She's got a bowl of food for you in her hands. A warm, hot, steaming bowl of food, fresh food for you. When she comes to you with this food and places in front of you, I want you to grab a hold of her. 
and tell her that God sends his salams. Allah says salam to Khadija. And Allah gives her the good news. Congratulates her. Allah is congratulating her that she will have a palace in paradise. As vast and as far as the eye can see. Carved out of, singular, out of a singular pearl. It will have no joints and no cracks and no you know, pillars and no support beams. One singular pearl carved out inside of it. As far as the eye can see. There will be no noise. No difficulty. No adversity. There ever. And that palace is ready. God has prepared it himself for Khadija. And he wants to let her know that he's got it ready for her. And he sends her salam to let her know that he waits for her. When the Prophet ﷺ tells Khadija radiallahu anha, she breaks down into tears. That God says salam to me. He knows who I am. He sends salam to me. This is who Khadija was. When we talk about the Prophet wasallam and how amazing he was, understand that Khadija was, was a remarkable woman. A lot of times, you know, in our, in our society today, we are fascinated by, we are obsessed with, you know, this idea of this young love and being fanatically crazy, punch drunk love, right? We're just obsessed with this idea of young people going crazy, and, and, you know, what fascination and obsession and infatuation, what we consider to be love is like. This was their love. What brought them together, what attracted them? It was the nobility of each other's character. It was how remarkable and dignified and amazing they were. That unified them, that gra they gravitate. You know, I always, I, I don't mean to be disrespectful. We're talking about Muhammad Rasulullah and Khadija al-Kubra radiallahu anha, our mother, Khadija. But you know, there's a little expression that the youngins have. They say, game recognize game. Right? The Prophet sallallahu recognized the nobility of Khadija and Khadija recognized the honor and the character of Rasulullah sallallahu High and noble characters were brought them together. What unified them together. They were made for each other. And through thick and thin, think about it, to experience a loss of two babies, the death of two of your children, to go through all the hardship that they went through together, for her to stand by him through thick and thin, through such a difficult, arduous task and mission, for him to live on for another 12, 13 years after she passed away, never forgetting about her, always living with her memory, that's love. That was the love story of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. And this is something I kind of wanted to maybe say for another session, inshallah, that we need to do. But just a little bit of advice. You know, there's a lot of younger people in our community who are trying to get married, interested in getting married, dare I say desperate to get married. Um, and I understand. It's natural, it's, it's, it's a part of our deen. It's a part of our human nature. Number one, be, understand what our deen teaches us about marriage. We're so sometimes focused on the superficial, that character, that nobility, that integrity, that honor, that is what really matters. That runs deep. That tells you more about the person than anything else. Look for character, look for integrity, don't look for nobility. Yes, compatibility, of course, that is the essence of compatibility and fine. There are other things and that's fine to take them into consideration. But remember that character, that integrity, that nobility, that's the most important factor. That is what the Prophet ﷺ meant when he said, Fadfar bi that deen. That's deen, not superficial deen. We have too much of this mindset. He's got a beard, she's got a hijab, match made in heaven. Right? We got too much of this mentality. Character, integrity, honor, nobility, dignity, quality, character. 
Look at that. That tells you more about the deen and the person's relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than anything else. And that is also compatibility. The second thing is this. And this is kind of tiptoeing, kind of towing the line. And so I apologize if it offends anyone. Nobody is better than Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And no woman is better than Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha from this ummah. And look how they got married. It was very practical, it was very pragmatic. It wasn't this type of this very suffocated, very overly complex, super formal, complicated marriage process where your neighbor's cousin's aunt's uncle's barber's dog has to like be referred and be checked with in regards to the marriage. That's one extreme. The other extreme is that, I don't know, where like, like just you're not supposed to even know the name or see the person that you're getting married to. So there's, uh, there's a very practical, of course there's dignity and there's honor. On the other extreme, we also have to be careful that we don't engage in an illegitimate, illicit relationship before getting married. Nothing good is built on a faulty foundation. Nothing good is built on a faulty foundation. Don't bi- try to build the structure on top of a shaky foundation. You start off in the ma'asiyah and the disobedience of Allah, that doesn't end well. It doesn't. Maybe somebody started off wrong, you can correct that. But you got to come correct. You got to come correct immediately. ASAP. Right now. Right here, right now. But just some general nasiha, more importantly to our elders, to our parents, and to our young people who are trying to get married, Understand that there are a lot of very interesting factors in the Prophet's marriage to Khadija radiallahu anha. She was older than him by all narrations. Not a single narration mentions that, that it was otherwise. Like I told you, there's a few different narrations about her age, but all narrations agree in one thing. She was older than him. She was a working business professional woman. They, got, they did business together respectfully, properly, but they interacted in business professional terms. And they got to know a lot about each other professionally, properly. A lot of these factors are very important. Her friend is the one who actually first takes the proposal and suggests the idea. And the Prophet ﷺ does get his family involved and does approach her family. Study this model of marriage and you'll understand that the flexibility and the versatility within our religion of how to find marriage and how to approach marriage is very, very practical and very pragmatic. We ourselves have stunted the process and made it overly complex and too difficult or gone way outside the bounds and the limits of what is permissible. Two extremes. Either we're too rigid or we're too lax. Find that balance in the middle. Be practical, be pragmatic, be respectful towards yourself, towards the other, towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and respect the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And find that balance in the middle. And lastly and finally, understand that a relationship, a marriage, a family, a household that is centered around the belief in Allah and puts Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the center of that marriage and that relationship will be one that will be blessed with not just love and, and affection and compassion and mercy in this life, but it will be an eternal marriage. That couple will be blessed with not only happiness in this life, will, be, will live a life of happiness together in this life, but they will be joined together and live a life of happiness for all of eternity in the life of the hereafter. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who are married, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all with happiness and tranquility, love and compassion. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep those couples and those families that are together, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep them together in happiness through thick and thin. And those who are not married, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provide for them uh, love and compassion through marriage. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make their marriages a means of pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reunite them in Jannatul Firdaus al-A'la.